Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Experimental Cataclysm, the show where we talk about recent changes to the experimental version of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. It's another relatively light week. I didn't see anything that was earth-shaking. There's no new mechanics or anything like that to talk about, but towards the end of the show, we will be talking a little bit about the Exodii, so there are some light spoilers towards the end of the video. Additionally, uh, you know, so I started a RimWorld Let's Play on the channel. Now, I know most of you are not here for that. You are here for information about Cataclysm, but I did want to plug the series anyway. There's some solid commentary, like, uh, just listen to this joke. So he basically says, oh, you have any dead bodies in the trunk? And I, without thinking, immediately say, oh, I don't know, they were alive when I put them in there. Now that's gold, internet. You should check it out. The series is actually going pretty well. I'm enjoying it quite a lot. Uh, or don't check it out. That's totally fine, and it definitely doesn't negatively affect my self-esteem in any way. But anyway, let's just get into the show. So first up today, we have a change to address some graphical glitches with the game. Now when I saw this, I got pretty excited. Any time that I alt-tab out of Cataclysm and then come back in, it, some weird stuff will happen to the display. Now the main problem for me personally was the mini-map. If I alt-tabbed for any reason, my mini-map would completely completely black out until I moved around and then, you know, it got refreshed and it came back. Now if you've watched any of my tutorials or anything like that, you've probably seen this in my videos. So I saw this PR and was surprised that it might finally be getting addressed. But alas, this was not the graphical issues that they were seeking to fix. Instead, QROX sought to address two other issues. Now the first thing, you may have seen this, is that a row of pixels at the bottom of the screen would become frozen when you would alt tab. Now there's an image in the PR that shows this pretty well, I've seen it happen in my game like a billion times, but it always seemed to lock just to being black pixels. So the image in the PR here is actually a little bit clearer. You can see that it's actually a frozen bit of terrain. And then the second issue, if I understand the PR right, was related to alt tabbing after receiving an error message. So the process would go like this. You would load a save game, for example, and while it was loading, you would alt tab out to a different screen. Then the game would print an error message of some sort while the game was not the main focus of your screen. And when you alt tabbed back into the game, the screen would simply be black. Now, if you didn't know about this, you would think that your game was frozen. In reality, the error was there. It was waiting for you to ignore it or whatever. You just couldn't see it. So QROX appears to have fixed both of those issues. Now, I could not get either of them to trigger after this PR was merged, so it does seem to be fixed. Although, I guess that might depend on, you know, which renderer you use or something like that. But for me, both of those seem to be fixed. Anyway, good work. The minimap was the first thing that popped into my head, but I have seen both of these other issues as well. So it's nice that someone came along and cleaned those up. Now, next up today, we've got the addition of leather cordage from Atomic Fox. This is a pretty straightforward change. Uh, basically, it adds a way for players to craft short and long string from leather, essentially is what this is. These are both referred to as leather laces. Now, the short lace is crafted from leather patches, and the long lace is crafted from six smaller laces. Now, it's pretty straightforward, really. Both of these use the tailoring skill at a level of zero, which I think makes sense. They were also added to several recipes manually, as well as being added to the list of possible string items. Now, I don't know how to phrase this, but I think you will know what I mean. Looking here at the butchery kit, for example, it requires some sort of string to tie like your little Dexter style parcel of murder tools. And instead of listing a bunch of string manually in the recipe, the game actually just displays the list for string, showing all possible items that you could use for that part of the craft. So the leather lace has been added to this category, so it should appear and be usable in basically every recipe that would require string. Anyway, though, I'm happy to see this. Now, cordage is generally not in high demand. It's pretty easy for the average player to get strings and ropes and things like that. However, I could see this being a value in niche situations or for people doing some sort of a primitive playthrough or in the woods or whatever. Or actually, since they come from leather patches, I don't even know if that is viable, right? Because, you know, leather patches generally come from pre-cataclysm manufactured items. Uh, but whatever, the point is that leather works as cordage and now we've got that in the game. Next up, also from Atomic Fox, we've got the ability to use milk substitutes in some recipes. We got almond milk and soy milk and whatnot from, um, I think it came from a mod several years ago, I'm not really sure. I remember when they were first added, I found them pretty much all the time, and now I don't see them as much. And I do find that a bit odd, a pretty large percentage of the population is lactose intolerant. But anyway, that doesn't really matter. Point is, these lactose-free milks have been added to certain crafting recipes where they make sense. It works the same 
as the leather cordage that I just mentioned previously. These options will be automatically displayed along regular milk in many appropriate recipes. You cannot actually use vegetable milks for everything. They're not actually milk, of course, but there are plenty of recipes where they fit. For example, chocolate milk. It doesn't really matter if it's real milk or vegetable milk. If you throw some chocolate in there, then it's chocolate milk. Other examples here are things like chowder, coffee with milk, pancakes, and you know, blah, blah, you get it. Now on that note, real quick, the pancake recipe requires maple syrup. You literally cannot make pancakes in this game without maple syrup, and that's really dumb. I think someone should change that. I know that the description mentions maple syrup, but that makes no sense. Syrup is a topping. It's not a requirement for making pancakes. Uh, in other words, it's not like flour, right, or eggs, which are absolute necessities. It's stuff that you dump on top of the finished product. And having syrup as a requirement for every single pancake recipe in the game it's, it's dumb, I don't understand that at all. Anyway, the reason I mentioned pancake is because there is an actual issue with this with the PR. Now, foods do not inherit lactose intolerance from their components. This means that even if you use vegetable milk to make something like pancakes, then the final product will still contain lactose. Now, this has always bothered me. A pancake contains so little milk or can even be made without milk in real life. And yet every single pancake in the game will make a lactose intolerant character sick. Most people eating a pancake, even if it contains milk, are not going to have a real reaction to the lactose inside. And now that you can make them with lactose-free milk, they should result in lactose-free pancakes, but instead they are still toxic for lactose intolerant players. So even though this is a good addition and I am happy to see it, I was disappointed to find that dairy is not inherited. So this does not actually benefit lactose intolerant players in the way that you would expect it to. Making dairy inherited like we have for cannibal or mutant meat items would be a fair bit of work, so I'm sure that no one's excited to go and do that, but it is something I'd like to see eventually. That's all I've got for this change, though. I, I like the change, but it is undercut by the fact that the final product still contains dairy, which I assume is still true for every other recipe in the game that can use regular milk in addition to the newly added vegetable milks. Next up, also from Atomic Fox, which, you know, okay. That's three mentions in the show. Thank you for adding stuff. Shout out for the fox, you know, blah, blah, etc. Anyway, from Atomic Fox, horses will now reproduce. Quite a few animals in the game are capable of spawning young versions of, you know, whatever animal they are, and now horses can do it too. Now, this does jive with realism. After extensive testing and millions of dollars that I've invested into research, I have proven that horses can, in fact, reproduce. Now, this isn't especially noteworthy other than, you know, it makes sense to bring horses in line with some of the other animal species. And my only negative thought here is that uh, foals take a good while to reach maturity. It's been a while since I was around horses in real life, but if I recall correctly, it's something like three years for them to reach full maturity. So I initially thought like, you know, what is the point of this? Most games of ours will not run that long. They're never going to reach proper horse status. And it looks like it takes about a year and a half in the game for a foal to become a full horse. And this is long enough that I think we can just treat it as an, like a reasonable approximation. Players are not going to tame horses and allow them to breed into foals that's just not uh, the scope of the game isn't that long so it doesn't actually matter if it takes a year and a half or three years for them to advance to a horse the vast majority of players don't play the game for you know a year and a half per save uh, also go ahead leave me a comment tell me how you play forever and you have a two-year game going that's great you know congratulations you're in the minority you are an exception you are not the rule uh, but anyway that's all i've got about that Next up, we've got a change to bug out bags from Bombastic Slacks. For those of you who don't know, a bug out bag or a go bag is something that you keep prepared in your home for emergencies. That way, when things go bad and you need to bug out, you just grab that one bag and you bail. Now, this is a popular survivalist thing, the basic idea being that you have all of your supplies in one portable piece of gear. Anyway, we've had these things in the game for a long time, but they were extremely rare and they always gave the exact same items. Now, Bombastic Bombastic Slacks has made them significantly more variable in what they contain. You can find these randomly on zombies or in houses, and there is a map extra that is just a uh, dropped bag on the ground, and the odds of finding them are not huge, which makes sense. Most people, you know, don't have these sort of things. And I mentioned the map extra specifically because we see a lot of items randomly on the ground, but we are, you know, we've gotten used to ignoring them as unimportant. Now though, if you find a random rucksack laying on the ground, you should definitely check it 
it out, it may be one of these new go bags. Now the old versions of these items still do exist. Those are the ones you have to disassemble and presumably that's just to keep the games that, uh, that already have them spawned in the save. It prevents those from being broken. Now, as I said, the old versions needed to be disassembled to get the items, but these new ones are just treated as backpacks that contain a variety of items. There isn't much to say about this. It's a neat little addition and the odds seem pretty decent for them to contain at least a few desirable items. Now we're going to talk about the Exodii. As I mentioned at the top of the show, there is some light spoiler stuff here. It's it's not as intense as stuff we've talked about in the past, but uh, yeah, there's your warning. This is your chance to get out if you don't want to know while the rest of us all look at this adorable kitten. Okay, anyway, uh, we've got two changes regarding Exodii stuff. Now, the first one is pretty simple and straightforward. The anesthesia quest for Rubik was not working properly. It did not remove the anesthesia from your inventory upon completion. In addition to fixing that, this quest now requires anesthesia rather than anesthesia kits, and it requires a small smaller amount. Now this overall just makes things a little bit easier. It's a, you know, it's easier to complete the quest now. And regarding the quest being broken, I remember experiencing that when it was first added, uh, you know, when we talked about it in one of these episodes, but I didn't realize that that was still a bug. I sort of figured it was just a bug that I had bumped into personally, not something that could be replicated. Oh, and this fix comes from Havrick, by the way, I'm assuming it's how you say your name. Now the other change related to the Exodii was the addition of signposts to point you at their main base. Now this change is from Urk and it's a nice little improvement. If you find Exodii safe houses or one of the uh, like their drop pods that include the quad creatures you should also find a sign. And if you interact with that sign using your examine key you will get a new mission. This mission will then point you towards the main base area which is where you would go to obtain bionics. Now like some of the other missions in the game this could be quite a large distance that you're going to have to travel. For me when I tested this to ensure that it was working it turned out to be about 150 map tiles away. Now this isn't any kind of, like it's not an obscene distance, but it wouldn't be the easiest thing to get to either. However, the really good news is that this mission actually spawns the location. So in my test, I had revealed the map using the debug menu, so I already knew what was on the map. When I got the mission, it actually spawned the base nearby. And this is good news. It means that it will never fail to find the location. It should guarantee that one gets spawned. Other than that, I don't have a lot to say about it. This is an improvement because it points the player towards uh, Rubik and the ability to get CBMs. We've also seen this happen with other factions in the game. As far as I know, if you go to any major faction that exists in the game currently, they point you in the direction of at least one other faction. I was going to give you examples, but maybe I shouldn't because, you know, factions are kind of spoilery and I shouldn't tell you who points you to who. You might not know even that that faction exists and I might ruin that for you. But essentially, most factions have at least one character in them that will point you at a different faction. And this is really good because the Cataclysm War World, we tend to live in a very small area. Even players who become nomadic might easily pass by a faction location and not realize that it's there. So if you find one and it points you to another and that one points you to a third, then you know it just makes finding them a little bit easier, which is also important because playtesting is how we figure out bugs like the anesthesia issue and we get them fixed. So anyway, just overall a, a good thing, you know, anyone getting pointed at the Exodii faction, I think that that's a, a good thing. It lets players who, you know, maybe they don't follow development, maybe they don't know these things exist, it increases the odds that they're going to stumble across that location. But anyway, I guess I probably talked about it too much. That's all I've got for now. Now I just wanted to pop in here at the end of the show. Uh, go ahead and skip this. You know, if you don't want to hear a mini rant, then that is essentially the end of the episode. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the series. However, I want to talk a little bit about Rubik based on some testing that I had to do for this video. Now I was trying to get footage of Rubik's quest and stuff for this episode, but I ended up spending several minutes flipping through their dialogue just trying to get that stupid quest so I could get some footage. And ultimately, I didn't even really use that footage in the video. But while I was doing this, I just, I, I have to say this, Rubik's dialogue is terrible. It's a large dialogue tree with lots of offshoots, you know, many options for the player to select, many of which loop back into other dialogue. And that in and of itself is annoying sometimes, but it's really not that big of a deal. The big deal is the constant, unrelenting nonsense that is spewed out of this creature's mouth. Now I understand, for lore reasons and for fun, I understand why you chose to make them this way. But from a design perspective, I think using all of this slang, weird language is a very poor choice. I find it incredibly obnoxious to try and read and understand what is being said. Every time that I interact with Rubik, I have these exact same thoughts. I'm frustrated trying to read through a huge amount of dialogue that is
is written in basically unintelligible gibberish. This is a bizarre design choice. Ultimately, I am excited to interact with the Exodii, and when I find that the first main NPC from that faction that you can interact with, they speak like this, all, all that excitement I had is immediately gone. I don't really want to talk to Rubik. I don't want to read the lore when it's presented in this way. I'm not going to sift through this ridiculous language to get that lore. It, to me, this is a poor design choice, and it makes it hard for players to invest in this new faction. Now, to me, this is one of those artistic choices that a creator makes, but in practice, it's not actually a good thing. It reminds me a lot of that one Polaniuk or Polanuk, I don't know how you say his name, you know, but he wrote a novel with basically no grammar or punctuation. I know what you were going for. I get that it's an artistic and, it, it, you know, an aesthetic lore choice, but in practice, I find it pretty unbearable. And I don't know, I just think about that every time I do anything with Rubik, I find it extremely off-putting and it's really hard for me because I do. I want to invest in the Exodii faction, but I also don't want to read this. Anyway, I've never really expressed those things in a video, but it came up again in, you know, my recording and whatnot. And I just, I wanted to talk about that. Anyway, I think that's the end of the video. Sorry if that mini rant was like rude or something like that. I have many opinions about game balance and game design and choices that we make like this. And I just, you know, this is the show where I express those things. But with that, I think that's the end of the episode. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this uh, video was helpful and informative. I, of course, will be back in a couple weeks with another episode. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.